people think of horror in video games, it's always going to elicit some kind of automatic response, and more often than not this would be tied to their memories of playing a certain game at a much younger age. For me personally, this instant response is the original Doom. It's one of the first video games I have played that gave me nightmares. Coming in shortly after that is the original Resident Evil series, in particular Resident Evil 2. Now I can't remember exactly why, but at the time I played the second game before I actually played the first game. I don't think this was an entirely bad thing, as you could pretty much jump into the story of the second game and get a good grasp of what was going on, and I quickly went back and borrowed the original game off a friend anyway. In short, all you needed to know was that there was a deadly zombie outbreak in the fictional Raccoon City caused by the dangerous T-Virus, which was created by the evil Umbrella Corporation. All of the original three games took place in or around Raccoon City, with a heavy focus on a group of soldiers known as the STARS, short for Special Tactics and Rescue Service. Pretty sweet acronym. Long before people on the internet couldn't get enough of stupid zombie games, movies and TV shows, we had this series. These were all fixed perspective survival horror games developed originally for the PlayStation console exclusively by Capcom. And I'd say I'm one of the many gamers who has a special place in their heart for this iconic series. Understood? Yes, sir! No doubt it also influenced countless other games to follow, including the Silent Hill series, which would go on to become a successful and important survival horror franchise in its own right. The man behind this game was a guy named Shinji Mikami, as important to survival horror as Shigeru Miyamoto is to platformers. Despite where the series has ended up and what fans may think about its current state, it's hard to deny the impact and quality of these first three games. So let's go back to where it all started, to when survival horror was truly in its inception, and look at these three undisputed classics. I should mention that it might be best if you played and finished all these games before watching this video, as we're going to be going deep into spoiler territory here. Don't say I didn't warn you. Don't come this way! No! So the first game in this series was released in 1996, known as Biohazard in Japan, but strangely changed to the title of Resident Evil pretty much everywhere else in the world. Resident Evil. After a surprisingly lengthy intro cinematic, we learn that STARS members Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine are investigating a series of grisly murders in the forest outside Raccoon City. After being attacked by strange creatures, they flee to a creepy looking mansion alongside other STARS members Barry Burton and Albert Wesker. Stop it! Don't open that door! At this point, the player is given the option to choose from playing as either Jill or Chris, both of which have some minor differences in gameplay, but quite significant differences in the narrative. Let me take care of this. For instance, playing as Jill means you'll mostly be working alongside Barry Burton, whereas if you play as Chris, you'll be helped by a STARS Bravo team member, Rebecca Chambers. Chris has a total of six inventory slots, whereas Jill has eight, and she also gets a lockpick that can unlock certain locked areas instantly. On the flip side though, Chris can take a lot more damage than Jill can, making him much more resilient in combat. Early on in the game, when you're inevitably going to be poisoned by a large snake, during Chris's campaign he ends up getting rescued by Rebecca, who provides him with an antidote. I think you'll be alright, because I gave you a shot. However, Jill has to make a trek to the medical room to get the antidote herself. Now these are the kind of minor differences that are quite common and give the game a good amount of replayability. Regardless of which character you choose, at the end of the game you're also able to rescue the remaining character before the final boss fight. Let's talk about it later. Let's get out of here. I think most people would agree though that Jill is really the easy mode of the two, able to get her hands on the bazooka, which is one of the best weapons in the game, and she can also gain access to a shotgun much quicker than Chris can, which showcases the infamous Jill sandwich line that has become a favorite amongst Resident Evil fans. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, these two campaigns play out the same for the most part. You're dropped into this very large mansion and have to slowly explore and uncover what has been going on. I don't think I'm looking at this with rose-tinted glasses when I say that it's a pretty well-told story, ignoring all the horrible voice acting, and throughout the game we learn the history of the Umbrella Corporation and that of a man named Oswell Spencer. During the game's finale, STARS member Albert Wesker betrays the group and releases the tyrant creature, which serves as the final boss. Within minutes you've encountered your first zombie, realized that something is very wrong, and you've had to come to grips with the controls and the mechanics. Now let's be honest guys, the controls have never been all that great and they really don't respond well under pressure. Turning around a corner in a fixed camera angle and walking into a zombie that you couldn't possibly have seen is common and frustrating. Resident Evil uses what is known as a tank control scheme where you rotate your character left and right and move either forward or backward. 
The game has something of an auto-aim system where you generally just kind of aim your weapon in the direction of an enemy and it often handles the rest. Whenever someone is below or above you, it can be a bit finicky though, and there are invincibility frames with enemies when they're knocked to the ground, but most of this stuff you learn through trial and error and the natural progression of playing the game. If you aim your shotgun upwards and wait until a zombie gets in nice and close, you can blow their goddamn head off with a single shot, which is both gory as hell and extremely satisfying. Resident Evil is a complex game, but I'd never call it confusing. You've always got to keep everything you've seen and everywhere you've been in your short-term memory. Just because you see something you're able to pick up doesn't really mean you need to. You're constantly backtracking through old areas of the mansion, and part of what makes the game so good is that constant decision making. The main healing items in the game are green, red, and blue herbs, and quite often you'll see a large bunch of them together. Collecting all of them can really clog up your inventory, making it impossible to pick up more pivotal items, which I really think is the essence of survival horror, juggling around your inventory and deciding whether or not you really need these items. About the only thing you ever need to consistently worry about in these games is saving your progress, which is something you have to do manually at typewriters throughout the game. Saving is a matter of having the ink ribbons to do so, but also timing it properly so you're not backtracking too much when you're killed or by using too many ribbons. There's a lot of puzzles to solve in this game and it can be annoying if you're forced to replay 15 or 20 minute segments because you screwed up, got killed and forgot to save. Now your first main goal is to find four crests to gain access to the garden house at the other end of the mansion, but this alone requires finding three different keys, which each have a couple side tasks you need to accomplish beforehand. There's also a couple of doors in the game that require a fourth key, but you won't even get your hands on this until about two thirds into the game. Again, some of these puzzles may differ depending on who you're playing as. In Jill's campaign, there's a section where playing the Moonlight Sonata on a piano in the bar is gonna open up a nearby secret passage, which contains a crucial item. Chris, however, has to rely on Rebecca Chambers to play the piano for him, though she first needs a bit of time to practice. Despite being a creepy mansion filled with zombies, Resident Evil does at times feel more like a puzzle game with a focus on inventory management than an actual action horror game. In fact, the zombies can often be little more than a nuisance than a real threat. Now that's not to say there's no shortage of things to kill you. As you'll progress, you'll encounter zombie dogs, zombie crows, spiders, giant snakes, sharks, an overgrown plant, and other monstrosities that I don't even really know how to define. Hunters are probably the most infamous of the entire bunch. At a point in the game when you've probably cleared out most of the mansion and are pretty well stocked up on ammo and supplies, then you encounter these assholes. They're kind of like toads with large claws that leap at you for a damaging melee attack and they're even able to decapitate you if your health is low enough. To make it even worse, they've completely infested the mansion and appear in almost every single room you have to traverse. It was a great way of throwing a spanner into the works at a point where first time players would have settled into a rhythm of either avoiding the basic zombie types or becoming quite proficient at killing them. Now you've got this all new, largely erratic and unpredictable enemy type to contend with that is a genuine threat at times. You're never really forced into killing anything in this game, save for a few boss fights and running past most enemies is actually a preferred tactic, also making the game more tense. One of the mechanics in Resident Evil is the way that when you enter a new area, the game loads an animation of the door opening as you walk through it. And what I think was originally a technical limitation of the PlayStation console actually helped the game's atmosphere immensely. Let's be real for a minute though. As good as this game is to people who are familiar with it, it is terribly clunky and unforgiving for newcomers. A lot of the gameplay mechanics are horribly antiquated and haven't really aged all that well. Like I said, the manual save system can require a lot of backtracking and running around. Juggling things around your inventory again is a staple of survival horror, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. When an item no longer has any use, you can discard it, but until then, it's always gonna take up an inventory slot. And it never really made sense to me how a key can take up as much space as a shotgun or a bazooka. The health system in the game isn't all that useful either. You're either in a fine, caution, or a danger state. However, you can still be killed in a single hit in the caution state depending on the enemy type, so it's not really the best indicator of your current status. Avoiding enemies often seems to be more a matter of luck than your mobility. Sometimes you'll run right past a bunch of zombies or hunters and they won't lay a finger on you. Yet other times they seem to be able to grab onto you with frightening precision. Then there's other issues with the auto aim system. You know, sometimes your bullets won't go where you want them to or they'll just miss entirely, which really sucks with more powerful guns like the Colt Python, where ammo is much more limited.
But in the areas where it truly counts, Resident Evil is still a fascinating and enjoyable game, from its monster and zombie designs to the layout and pacing of the campaign, through to the multiple endings dependent on various factors you may or may not have met and the character you're playing as. I can still remember unlocking that infinite rocket launcher for the first time all those years ago and totally trivializing the majority of the game by overusing it. Also, as cheesy as all those live action cinematics are, I still enjoy watching them and it just encapsulates that 90s period of gaming so well. No! Don't go! There was a director's cut released in 1996 which modified a few minor parameters and included an arrange mode which swapped around the placement of items. But the best version of the game I feel is the GameCube remake released in 2002 and also eventually ported to the PC in 2015. Not only does this overhaul every visual element of the game, but it improves the controls, redoes all the voice acting and cinematics, and includes new and more elaborate puzzles whilst retaining all of the elements of the game that made it so unique and challenging. The lighting in particular in some of these redone areas is just downright artistic. This to me is the best version of the game out there at the moment. I would still suggest people play through the original director's cut, but then give this remastered version a go right after. Capcom are also working on a similar remaster for Resident Evil 2 as well. And on that note, let's take a look at that game then too, shall we? Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2 was released two years after the first game in 1998, again exclusively for the PlayStation, though it was later ported to several other consoles as well. The information we've got on the game's development cycle is actually kind of interesting. Originally it was much different in tone when it was still being directed by Shinji Mikami. Then at some point over disagreements with Capcom, Hidekai Kamiya stepped up to direct the project and Mikami took a backseat as a producer. It's really hard to tell whether or not this ultimately affected the game that much, but still, what we got was an amazing experience and a much more lavish and cinematic game. What, what is this thing? The story follows on shortly after the events in Resident Evil 1, roughly two months to be precise, taking place in Raccoon City itself after an outbreak of the T-Virus has turned the vast majority of citizens into zombies. This portrays a much more believable setting with a real sense of despair and hopelessness as you see a community that has totally fallen apart. Again, the player chooses from two characters, either Claire Redfield, the sister of Chris from the first game, or Leon Kennedy, a rookie cop who is literally on his first day on the job when the shit hits the fan. <laughs> These two characters conveniently meet each other during the intro cinematic before they're separated and end up doing their own thing inside and around the Raccoon City Police Department building. They interact with each other at a couple key points, but largely they're off flying solo, but it is still similar to the Spencer Mansion in a sense. It's this one huge complex building that you slowly explore. Probably the first thing you're likely to notice about Resident Evil 2 is the visuals, which are considerably better than the prior game. The pre-rendered backgrounds show off a lot more detail and are also larger on the whole. Character models are also much more detailed, and there's a higher variation on zombie types, meaning you'll see double ups less frequently. Animation across the board is also of a higher standard, and now when your character is wounded, it also affects the way they move, which is impressive technically, but also means of passively being aware of what state your health is currently in. On the whole, Resident Evil 2 is a much more action-packed game with a much higher concentration of zombies throughout. Unlike the first game though, the campaigns for each character have some pretty huge differences. They both start off in the streets of Raccoon City, where they shortly make their way to the nearby police station, though the placement of items and monsters is entirely different. Then there's also a secondary campaign for each of them that switches it up even more, referred to as the A and B campaigns. Playing as Leon, you explore the police station for items and resources, eventually teaming up with a woman named Ada Wong before the two of you head to an underground umbrella laboratory to destroy a new and improved tyrant creature for the game's finale. When playing as Claire, you'll still end up in the police station, but you also actually uncover the truth behind the outbreak in the Raccoon City Police Department. Are you Chief Irons? Yes, that's me. And end up involved in a minor escort quest of sorts, as you babysit a girl named Sherry Birkin, whose parents created something called the G-Virus, which is like a much more deadlier strain of the T-Virus. My mom called and told me to go to the police station because it was too dangerous to stay at home. During Claire's campaign, you'll also be hounded frequently by a large figure known as Mr. X, which is a creature sent into the city by the Umbrella Corporation to kill all the survivors and obtain the G-Virus. This thing would have a big influence on the third game, Resident Evil Nemesis, and the way it pops up throughout the campaign and attacks Claire directly mirrors the way Nemesis would hunt down and pursue Jill Valentine throughout the third game. <laughs> 
Other differences between playing as Leon and Claire again mainly affect weapons and items. Leon gets his hands on more powerful weapons like the Magnum and is able to upgrade his pistol and shotgun. Claire gets the grenade launcher exclusively, much like Jill Valentine got the bazooka in the first game, though her other weapons are arguably not as useful. And personally, I find her campaign to be the harder of the two. Leon has a Zippo lighter and Claire gets a lockpick, though they're not used quite as much, so it doesn't make either character all that different in that regard. I mean, I think there's about two times you're required to use the lighter and you don't even need the lockpick to progress through the game. On top of that, considering how quickly she takes damage from some of the tougher enemy types, I really do think this makes her the more difficult campaign. Again, you can unlock stupidly overpowered weapons to use as well, like an infinite rocket launcher and even a Gatling gun if you manage to finish the game in less than three hours. And I'm not gonna lie, they're pretty awesome. So maybe I'm a bit biased because I played this game before the others, but I really do think this is the best out of the original three games. The layout of the police station is seamless and the pacing is just right from the acquisition of weapons and items through to the way the difficulty slowly ramps up. The puzzles are challenging without ever being too confusing and I think there's only a couple of moments I got stumped and most of the time the solution was staring me right in the face. Some of the puzzles can seem a little bit out of place at times, I mean the way certain items have been hidden away in a police station is in direct contrast with the realism of the setting. Like why is someone going to hide red jewels in a touch plate lock statue? just as a means of keeping a key to the evidence room hidden away. This made sense in the Spencer Mansion during the first game as the entire thing was designed that way to stop anyone from gaining access to the Umbrella Labs beneath the estate. In the Raccoon City Police Department, it doesn't really make that much sense that someone would put all these elaborate puzzles around what is otherwise a fully functional and believable looking building. But I guess you need to take this thing on face value and it wouldn't have been that much fun if the game was just about going through people's drawers and cupboards. One thing I always liked about Resident Evil 2 was it also has a lot more great sort of jump out of your seat moments as well, much more than the first game ever did. Like that cinematic when you encounter the liquors for the first time as an example. Oh boy. Or during one of the scripted events when you're attacked by Mr. X when playing as Claire. The dynamic between Leon and Ada is equally as developed as the relationship is between Claire and Sherry. And she's about as least annoying as she could have possibly been for a 12 year old girl that you have to escort in a video game. As cheesy as some of the cinematics might be, they're still full of classic horror tropes and storytelling devices and the way you slowly uncover this sinister plot across both campaigns is actually masterfully told. Sorry, but I won't just hand over my life's work. But I think the great thing about this game too is you don't entirely need to have played the first game to get the gist of what's going on. Leon doesn't have any involvement with any of the other characters aside from being embroiled up in Umbrella's plans, and Claire can simply be looked at as someone that's just looking for a brother. Astute Resident Evil fans will remember that Ada Wong's name was used as the password to access a computer terminal in the underground labs at the Spencer Mansion in the first game, which is a neat little reference, but it's not entirely mandatory knowledge to get the most out of the game. I mean, her true intentions as a spy would be a revelation whether or not you knew anything about her in the first place. Now hand it over. Don't make me shoot you. Now the issues I have with Resident Evil 2 again reflect those seen in the first game, being, you know, control issues, juggling around inventory space, and backtracking to pick up items to complete puzzles. Due to the higher enemy count, it is also possible to be caught in the middle of a small group where you can do little more than just watch yourself die. I've never found the boss fights in any of these games to be all that fair, and Resident Evil 2 continues this trend. In fact, for a couple of them, literally the best way to beat the boss is to just stand there and spam your most powerful weapon and hope that they go down before you do. But I'd really have to be looking for things to complain about and get into some serious nitpicking, which is something I'm not going to do. You know, for me, this is Resident Evil at its absolute finest. And it encapsulates everything this series is about. Survival horror, big guns, horrifying enemies, and lots of blood and gore. It's the Empire Strikes Back of video game sequels, and if I ever had to write a top 10 games list, I'm pretty sure this game would be up there. So then having said that, how does the final game in the trilogy hold up? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Let's just find out then, shall we? Resident Evil. So finally on to Resident Evil 3, the third game for the PlayStation and much like its predecessors, one of the best games available for the platform. 
Resident Evil 3 is probably the most interesting game out of the entire bunch in that it adds a few new gameplay mechanics like ammo crafting, which we'll talk about a bit later on, a new dodge move for Jill where she can avoid incoming attacks, and most importantly the inclusion of Nemesis as a recurring boss fight throughout the campaign. Nemesis is a super pissed off tyrant that is pursuing you constantly. Now whilst initially unseen, after about a mere 20 minutes or so of playtime you see this thing firsthand, as it kills poor old Brad Vickers before giving the player the option to either run from it or engage it in direct combat. The latter being practically suicide as you're massively under equipped at that point. As you get more powerful weapons you can stand a better chance against him but he's still going to kick the living shit out of you most of the time and taking him down provides some of the most challenging gameplay in this third game. On the flip side though, you only get the option to play as Jill Valentine, whereas before the game offered us two choices. What this means is that the campaign is a lot more tighter structured and the pacing of the narrative is much faster. What, is that? what I've always liked about the original three games is the way their campaigns all feed off one another and Resident Evil 3 does this exact same thing once again. Hopping into the stylish leather boots of Jill Valentine, we're returning once again to Raccoon City, a mere day before the story that unfolded in Resident Evil 2. You'll be using familiar items like lockpicks, cigarette lighters and first aid sprays along with weapons like the shotgun, the magnum and the grenade launcher. It all feels really comfortable. Side characters include a group of umbrella mercenaries, Carlos, Mikhail and Nikolai. Mikhail meets an untimely end against Nemesis but goes out like an absolute boss, whereas Carlos hangs around for the majority of the campaign and you even get to control him for a brief stint as he searches a hospital for supplies. I would think this game has the most variety in its locations out of all the three games as well. You initially start in Raccoon City, visiting the police station briefly, before leaving and completing a series of puzzles both up and downtown. After you leave the city you explore a clock tower, followed by the hospital as Carlos, then the Raccoon City parklands before the finale at an abandoned factory. Once again the level of detail with the pre-rendered environments is very impressive using some cinematic fixed camera angles, and the animation across the board is a step up from the previous game. The CGI cinematics are also of a much higher standard and though it might be a bit jarring going back and forth between the in-game graphics engine, they easily showcase some of the coolest moments in the game. This game has a real wrapping things up kind of feel to it and we see the return of familiar enemy types like the spiders, the dogs, the crows and those asshole hunters as well as zombies, lots of zombies. Despite wearing a miniskirt and tank top, Jill seems to be able to absorb a fair amount of damage. I'd say it's about the same as Leon or Chris. Added to her repertoire of moves is a kind of dodge mechanic where she'll hop backwards to avoid an incoming attack. And you can also pull off a quick 180 if you press the run button and down on the directional pad. This is a lifesaver at times and it makes her feel a little less rigid to control. The biggest addition however is Nemesis as this kind of unstoppable juggernaut that constantly pops up to ruin your day. Right from the get go we see him kill poor Brad Vickers with ease and it shows you that this asshole really means business. Fighting him is a choice you're given multiple times throughout the campaign, however you're only ever truly forced to fight him I think it's like once or twice. The other times you're just free to run away. On the lowest difficulty setting, there's not really any point to defeating him aside from patting yourself on the back, but on the hard mode which is really just a poorly labelled normal difficulty, he will drop important items each time he's beaten. Four of which can be used to upgrade your pistol and shotgun, two of which give you a first aid spray container which can hold up to three sprays at a time, only taking up a single inventory slot, and lastly the chance to get an assault rifle or an infinite ammo tool. Now when you're in combat with him, you'll likely notice a few things that are quite annoying and often unfair. For instance, he has a stupidly large range with his attacks. He's able to charge at you for a swinging punch and also rotate in the middle of this animation, making running past him quite difficult. He's also able to pick you up and throw you around like a ragdoll, and if you're unable to get up again in time, he can simply chain this attack for a second and potentially third time. He's a lefty which means running past his right side means he's less likely to catch you, but this will only minimise your chances of getting nabbed at best. I mean in the time it takes to raise your weapon, he can go from moving like an old man with arthritis to sprinting at you, picking you off the ground and heaving you across the room. And it's impossible to predict when he's going to do this as he never telegraphs these attacks. To make it worse, he soaks up hits from the most powerful weapons in Jill's arsenal, and combined with the amount of healing items you're bound to go through when fighting him, it can seem a bit redundant at times. 
I can see what they were going for though. They tried to create their own Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. You know that unstoppable force that just keeps coming back over and over despite how many times you kill them. And he is a great antagonist in that sense as you genuinely grow to fear and despise seeing him. Because how you're gonna handle it forces you to make a tough decision, more so if you haven't saved your progress in a while. But he can be really unfair and it's ultimately quite off-putting for people playing the game for the first time. In fact, I would recommend most people just simply avoid him for their first playthrough, as you'll probably spend more energy on being concerned about fighting him than just, you know, enjoying yourself, solving puzzles, and playing the game properly. Resident Evil 3 uses something of a random number generator system, and quite simply the way this works is that the game will randomly choose from a set of factors every time you play the game. On the small side of things, it's something like, you know, item and ammo placement, but it can also affect what types of enemies you encounter, and more importantly, how often Nemesis is going to show up. So you might head into an area and it's swarmed with zombies, but the next time you play it, it could be hunters or dogs instead. You never really quite know what to expect. The most notable of these is a weapon spawn early in the game, which can be either a magnum or the grenade launcher, the result having a huge effect on the first half of the campaign. As I mentioned earlier, the other new mechanic in this game is the reloading tool. You still use basic ammunition types like pistol, shotgun, magnum, and grenade ammo, but now you're able to craft them to your choosing. You come across either Gunpowder A or Gunpowder B, which have a chance to appear at preset locations, and then you can mix them to craft Gunpowder C if you wish, or just create either handgun or shotgun ammo from them respectively. Adding powders to basic grenade ammo can give the ammo based properties like Acid, Flame, and Freeze. It just ultimately means more time spent screwing around in your inventory and moving things back and forth between those item boxes. I think there's a reason why this was the only game in the entire franchise to use this mechanic. The areas in this game also seem to be a lot more confined. I mean, initially you're in the Raccoon City streets, but these are some narrow-ass streets, and getting grabbed by zombies becomes all too common and really irritating. Combined with this RNG mechanic, where you might get a more mobile enemy type like the Hunters, in an area where you're very limited on space, it makes it much more difficult. <laughs> To be honest, it's not the hardest game in the series, and if you're not a complete idiot with your ink ribbons or items, you should be fine. But it can at times catch you off guard with whatever it randomly throws at you, and I'm not entirely sure the randomization you get across playthroughs is entirely fair. It seems to me like they wanted to try out a couple of things with this game, and I often get the sense that we're kind of like guinea pigs to Capcom. You know what I mean? Like some gameplay mechanics stayed on for the remainder of the franchise, and others got removed entirely. One of these inclusions, though, that stayed on was the Mercenaries mode, where you could play as one of the Umbrella Mercenaries and blast your way through a specific challenge, earning money to unlock powerful weapons. This is a fun enough little mode, even if it really is just a matter of figuring out the single best pattern to completion, and retrying that pattern over and over until it's ingrained into the back of your head. Ultimately, to me, this is the game I like the least out of these first three titles, despite it having Jill Valentine walking around in that skimpy outfit, not to mention the other six that could also be unlocked. But I give credit where credit is due, and as far as old school survival horror goes, this is still about as good as it gets. It's never quite going to be the same experience each time you play it, and making different choices against Nemesis encounters combined with the multiple endings and the RNG mechanics mean there is quite a lot of replayability. Also, going through the campaign with the weapons you've unlocked in Mercenaries mode is a whole heap of fun. After Resident Evil 5 had Chris Redfield punching boulders, I stopped following this series. I just couldn't keep up with it anymore, and every screenshot or gameplay clip I saw for each new installment just seemed to get more ludicrous and far removed from everything the series meant to me. And don't ever get me started on those movies. But I still do go back frequently and play these old games, and the legacy and the impact they left on me as a gamer is humongous. You know those moments when you'd stumble upon another save room and get that brief respite from danger? The moments when you encountered a new enemy type for the first time? or you first acquired a weapon like the shotgun or the Colt Python and went on a bit of a tear with that weapon with the limited ammo you had. There's few games out there that can conjure up such a sense of fear, anxiety and suspense and even playing them almost 20 years later, those emotions I think are still palpable. Individually, these games can be picked apart, ripped to pieces and thrown back together again. You could spend an entire video talking about all the mechanics that have aged and how things don't work as well as they used to, but it's kind of redundant to do that. I think they're as important to the gaming industry as much as other titles were, you know, games like Doom, Half-Life, Super Mario Bros., Grand Theft Auto 3, and so on. These games left their mark on the industry, and it's something that can never be wiped away. Yes, they're not perfect, they're dated, they're antiquated, and they can be incredibly frustrating at times. 
but it's still something that every single person should play before they die. And if that zombie apocalypse ever does come to pass, hey, at least you'll be suitably trained.